Bill, could we start out getting a general overview of your revolutionary approach? I don't know that it's revolutionary, but, <laughs> <know>. but um, <laughs> often in the addiction field, the model has been you need to put something into the person or, or change them or convince them mm -hmm. or confront them. And this is more of a drawing out of the person uh, approach. And uh, you mentioned ambivalence yeah. just a moment ago. And it's a place where people get stuck. They, they want to, they don't want to, and they have trouble moving off that space. And this is a way of helping people to resolve that ambivalence and, uh, and move on toward behavior change. It's both client-centered and directive, which is an odd combination mm. in some folks' minds, uh, but very interested in the person's own perspective, very concerned with how they understand things and what they want with their lives. At the same time, it's not just following the person. It, it's moving the person along in the direction of change. In a couple of minutes, we're going to watch you work with a young man named Mike. Uh, can you help our viewers uh, and, you know, just to focus on what it is that they might be looking for in your work, some of the techniques or some of the strategies that you might be using? Yeah. Well, besides the principles that, uh, that I talked about before, mm -hmm. the way that one usually opens a session like this is, is with an open question, one that, that invites the person to tell you about themselves. And not just one of those, but a series of open questions. I, I try uh, not to ask closed-ended questions very often, but to give, one, give a question where the client can uh, move around a bit and then follow with reflective listening very much. You and I were talking how easy he makes this look, so yeah. it's important that the viewers know that there are really strategies that you're using. Oh, yes. Yeah, and it, it's, it does take a while to learn this. Uh, also, <laughs> in, in what I'm reflecting, um, and Rogers did this too, although he wasn't aware of it, yeah, in what I'm reflecting, I'm differentially reflecting back the client's own statements that are moving in the direction of change, acknowledging the other side as well, um, but helping the person move along. Uh, there's acknowledgement of the person's freedom to choose mm -hmm. and the re uh, respect for that position. But listening for the person's own motivation, for their own goals, for their own desire to change, and reflecting and encouraging and, and moving that along as we go and, and providing the encouragement and the hope that that can happen. And this client was very ambivalent, wasn't he? Yeah, and that's, that's not uncommon. For some reason, we pathologize that in the addiction field, but, but ambivalence is very human. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's a normal part of the change process that when you go from not thinking about change to beginning to think about it, you must pass through a period of ambivalence. Mm -hmm. And it's just that that's where people get stuck. And this is a particularly interesting case because he's very aware of being there mm -hmm. and very aware of how uncomfortable it is to be at the ambivalent place and very aware that he has to move one way or the other. He has to move forward and resolve the ambivalence by changing his behavior, or move backward and resolve the ambivalence by shutting down and saying it isn't really a problem. Well, since I'm not sure are three of my favorite ambivalent words, I'm looking forward to watching this. All right. Well, let's watch your work with Mike. Okay. <laughs> 